Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sophie Tuscan Duplantier? Another question here is, can I offer my thoughts on the Netflix documentary titled, Sophie, A Murder in West Cork? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime. I'll offer my analysis and a review of the documentary. Sophie Tuscan Duplantier was born in Paris, France on July 27, 1957. She married. The couple would have a son sometime around 1982. After this, she divorced. She would marry again in 1991, this time to a man 16 years her senior named Daniel Tuscan Duplanty. Daniel was a well-known film producer. Sophie worked as a television producer. Sophie had an affair not long after being married, but she and Daniel reunited in 1993. Sophie bought a cottage in a remote part of West Cork, Ireland, called Skull. She had lived with an Irish family briefly when she was young and enjoyed spending time there. The cottage was meant to be a vacation home. The particular area in West Cork had a number of artistically oriented individuals. It was considered safe. Many people didn't lock their doors at night. The land was rugged and featured low-quality roads. People visiting from other areas would often have difficulty finding their way around. Sophie traveled from France to Ireland on December 20, 1996. She was 39 years old at this time. She was going to spend a few days in the cottage alone before returning to Paris, France for Christmas. Before she left, she mentioned to a friend that a neighbor in Ireland named Ian Bailey was exploring themes of violence in his writing. On December 22, Sophie visited an area not far from her cottage called Three Castle Head. She reported seeing a woman, a white shape. Sophie was afraid and had a deep sense of unexplainable terror. This connects to a superstition about a ghost who lives there. If people see her, it means they're going to die. Which makes me wonder, why would people visit that area if they believed in the myth? Is it a thrill-seeking thing? Like people want to see a ghost, they're all excited when they see her, but then they're like, oh yeah, I forgot about the dying part. That just takes all the fun right out of it. Moving back to the narrative, at 6 p.m., a light was seen on in Sophie's house. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Sophie's body was discovered by a neighbor on December 23, 1996, at 10 a.m. Sophie had been brutally murdered. Her body was in the driveway of her house next to a metal gate. She was dressed in a t-shirt, leggings, and boots. Her clothing was tangled up in a barbed wire fence. There were also vines with thorns on them in the vicinity of the body. Blood was identified on a concrete block not far from her body and a metal gate. Due to Christmas traffic and getting lost on the way to the crime scene, the state pathologist did not arrive for 28 hours. Sophie's body was left in the elements for that entire time. The body had swelling on the brain, multiple blunt head injuries, a skull fracture, lacerations, and her fingers were broken. The damage to her face was so extensive that the neighbor could not identify her as Sophie. The authorities believe that Sophie was murdered sometime between 11 p.m. on December 22 and when her body was discovered at 10 a.m. on December 23. Taking a look at some of the other evidence found at the crime scene, there was a low-quality footprint found in the driveway. Sophie had lived alone in the house. Nothing was disturbed there, but the police did find two wine glasses, suggesting she may have had company at some point. There were no fingerprints on the wine glasses. Sophie's door key was inside the back door lock, with the rest of the keys on the keychain hanging down. In the bedroom, Sophie's bed was raised. She had a contractor come in and do this, consistent with the style in that area. She had no curtains on the window in her bedroom. It is believed this was because there was a lighthouse in view, and she did not want it to be obstructed. With the bed elevated and no curtains, people could see right into her bedroom from the outside. In January 1997, a woman named Marie Farrell came forward and said that on December 23, at 3 a.m., she had seen an intoxicated man in a long coat waving his arms on a bridge about a mile from Sophie's house. She identified this individual as a local journalist named Ian Bailey. 
She also claimed to have seen Ian Bailey watching Sophie days before the murder near a shop. Later, Farrell claimed that Ian had intimidated her, asking her to retract her testimony. Several years later, she did retract her testimony, now saying that the man on the bridge was not Ian Bailey. Ian Bailey lived about three miles from Sophie's house with his partner Jules Thomas. Ian had moved to Ireland in 1991 and lived with Thomas starting in 1992. He had a variety of odd jobs. He worked on a fish farm, wrote poetry, sold pizzas at a local market, and was a freelance journalist. Ian started writing stories about Sophie's murder right after it happened. On the day the body was discovered, he had told people that he was reporting on the murder of a French woman yet he should not have known at that point that she was French. He arrived at the crime scene at 2.20 p.m., but left immediately. Usually people covering a story hang around and gather information. In one article he wrote on December 28, just five days after the homicide, he mentioned a few other items that he should not have known at that point, like Sophie died from blunt force trauma, two wine glasses were found, and the fact that she was not sexually assaulted. He also reported items that were not supported by the evidence, which seemed to be designed to shift attention away from him. For example, he wrote that Sophie had multiple companions and her house was a love nest. He would later suggest that Sophie's husband, Daniel, may have hired someone to kill Sophie or Sophie was having an affair and her lover killed her. Ian said that he didn't know Sophie. He'd only seen her once from a distance when somebody pointed her out. Several people disputed this account, saying that Ian Bailey had met Sophie before. There were various reports indicating that in the days after the murder, Ian had scratches on his hands, forearms, and a cut on his forehead. Ian Bailey was asked about these injuries. He said that the scratches on his hands and forearms came from cutting the top off of a Christmas tree on the morning of December 22. The cut on his head came from killing turkeys. Ian had spent time with others on the evening of December 22, they could not recall him having any injuries. The police said they could not reproduce the injuries on Ian Bailey's hands by cutting a Christmas tree. I'm not sure this is a valid analysis. I don't think Ian was saying that the expected result of his behavior was getting scratches. Rather, he just happened to get scratched when cutting that particular tree. This is like the investigators looking at a car accident where somebody slammed into a telephone pole and saying, well, I drove down the road and I didn't hit anything. Again, it's not the expected result. It's something that just happened to occur on that particular occasion. The police asked Ian and his partner, Jules Thomas, about what they were doing the night of the murder. They initially told the police that they were in bed for the entire night. Thomas changed her story not long after this, now saying they went to bed at 10 p.m. At about 11 p.m., Ian left the bed and did not return until 9 a.m. the next day. She noticed a cut on his forehead that was not there when he left. Ian Bailey also changed his story, now saying that he woke up at 4 a.m., walked to his nearby studio, and worked on an article for about a half hour before returning to bed. So they changed their stories, and now the stories don't match. One witness who was in Ian's house on December 26 said that she saw scratches on his hands and his coat in a bucket of water in the bathroom. The police searched Ian's house, but did not find anything to connect him to the crime. They searched the nearby studio and found evidence that there was a fire in the yard. There were remnants of coats, jeans, boots, and a mattress. Ian Bailey also attracted attention to himself as a suspect by making some curious statements to other people in the community. Two months after the homicide, during a conversation with a 14-year-old boy, Ian said that he smashed her brains with a rock. In 1998, Ian went out drinking with another couple. Afterward, they went to his home, where he continued to drink. He started talking about the homicide and said, I did it, I did it, I went too far. Ian explained his confessions by saying he was using sarcasm, irony, and dark humor. Apparently, ineffectively, Ian was arrested in 1997 and in 1998, but the prosecutor never brought charges against him, saying there was not enough evidence. In 2001, Ian Bailey was arrested for assaulting Jules Thomas at their home. He had severely beaten her. She required reconstructive surgery. He was charged and convicted. He admitted this was the third time he had assaulted Thomas. Ian only received a three-month suspended sentence. 
so no jail time at all. The police in Ireland made a number of mistakes during the investigation of Sophie's murder. For example, they lost the metal gate with blood on it. They were accused of being corrupt. Essentially, their defense was that they were inept, not corrupt. Ian Bailey sued eight newspapers for libel in 2003, which backfired massively, as the proceedings brought forth a number of witnesses whose testimony implicated Ian in the murder. Ian was never charged with a murder in Ireland, but he was charged under French law. France extends their jurisdiction to anywhere in the world where a French citizen is murdered. They charged Ian Bailey, but Ireland would not extradite him, so France had the trial anyway. Ian Bailey was tried in absentia, found guilty of murder, and sentenced to 25 years in prison in 2019. Of course, this is all academic because Ireland, again, was not going to extradite him. Ian Bailey and Jules Thomas separated in 2020. At the time making this video, Ian remains free, and that will continue unless he leaves Ireland. Daniel remarried in 1998. It was his fourth marriage. He would die in 2003 following a cardiac arrest. Now moving to my analysis. Was Ian Bailey actually guilty? One justice system didn't even charge him, and another convicted him. Let's look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Ian Bailey was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Witnesses reported that Ian Bailey had met Sophie before the murder. She mentioned him before she even arrived in Ireland. Ian knew information about Sophie and the crime that he should not have known if he was innocent. Ian admitted to being outside the night of the murder. He confessed on two different occasions. There were cuts on his hands, forearm, and head that were not adequately explained. He had a history of violence toward his romantic partner, he had apparently burned possible inculpatory items next to his studio. There was a witness who said his coat was in a bucket of water a few days after the murder. And there is not really a good alternative suspect, although that could be the result of a poor investigation by the police. For example, looking at the hitman theory, like Daniel may have hired somebody to kill his wife, what type of hitman would use a concrete block and strike a victim 50 times? Also, Given that the authorities had trouble finding the crime scene, it's likely the killer was familiar with the area. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. The DNA recovered at the crime scene belonged to Sophie and one unidentified individual, not Ian Bailey. Marie Farrell said that the police coerced her into identifying Ian Bailey. Her testimony was all over the place. During her testimony on one occasion, she literally ran out of the courtroom after refusing to identify the mystery man that she was with the night of the murder. So this really makes it seem as though the police knew about this mystery man and they kind of made her a deal where she identified Ian Bailey and they didn't worry too much about following up on who she was with. There were no witnesses to the murder, no physical evidence ties Ian Bailey to the crime scene. So in considering all the evidence, do I think that Ian was guilty? I think he was, but there is certainly reasonable doubt in this case. The police did an awful job and tainted the investigation. Without adequately exploring alternative suspects, there's no way to know if Ian's truly guilty. Here's my theory about what happened. This is just a theory. Of course, I don't know what happened. Ian Bailey did not get along well in the community. He was described as self-centered, overconfident, arrogant, attention-seeking, and annoying. He drank excessively and would become violent on occasion. He walked to Sophie's house on December 22, perhaps he had seen her before through the windows with no curtain. Feelings of desire were building up. He approached the house and knocked on the door. Sophie probably opened the door. There was no sign of forced entry. Either immediately or upon realizing he was dangerous, Sophie fled out of the back door and ran down her driveway. Ian gave chase, catching up with her at the gate and pushing her to the ground. He picks up a concrete block and beats her to death. He returns to his residence and tries to destroy the evidence. The next day, his attention-seeking nature gets the best of him. He decides to start writing articles about the murder. But he has trouble keeping straight what he should know as a reporter versus what he does know as a killer. He is not cautious. He continues to drink. He confesses a few times. When he becomes sober, he is again afraid of going to prison. He tried to go on the offensive by suing newspapers and accusing the police of being corrupt although he may have been correct about the police. Now, it is possible that Ian was not responsible. 
It may have been another person who desired Sophie. It could have been a hitman. There are many unknowns in this case. Now moving to a review of the documentary on Netflix, Sophie, A Murder in West Cork. I'll go through both the positive and negative features. On the positive side, there were many interviews with the key players in the case, including Ian Bailey, although as I understand it, after being interviewed, Ian Bailey complained that he wanted his interviews removed from the documentary. Apparently, the people who made the documentary have no intention of doing that. The cinematography in the documentary was good. There were many great shots of West Cork. And I like how they included pretty much everything about the case in the documentary. When I looked at sources for additional information about the case, I found there really wasn't too much the documentary left out. On the negative side, this case isn't really shockingly complex, and yet it took the documentary about three hours to tell the story. The way they organized the information was not conducive to understanding the narrative. If they wanted to tell the story in such a non-sequential manner, they should have included a better summary of all the key evidence. Many true crime documentaries try to balance between revealing facts with eliciting emotion. I think this one focused a little too much on the emotion. So now moving to my final thoughts, what lessons can be learned in this case? Whoever was responsible for this crime, it only takes one person in an otherwise safe community to make it dangerous. If someone was evaluating a 55-gallon drum of water, they wouldn't refer to it as safe if it included even one drop of poison. When people talk about communities where they don't have to lock their doors and everyone knows everyone else, they forget that the line between life and death is just one person's behavior. Those are my thoughts on the case of Sophie Tuscan Duplanty. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis on this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.